Hi again, Dwight Wilson, page 183 of Armageddon Now, this chapter, The Certainty of Survival, More Speculation About the Role of Russia in the End Times. The threat of Russian expansion also brought increased speculation about who would lead the resistance to this invader from the north. Although somewhat complicated by the various chronologies discussed above, the various premillenarian schemes generally depicted a revived Roman Empire led by the beast, that is the Antichrist, as the focus of this resistance. William K. Harrison, in Christianity Today, discussed the circumstances that might bring such a leader to power. He felt that the threat of war and the chaos to an industrial civilization Let's read that again. He felt that the threat of war and chaos to an industrial civilization might cause the nations to surrender their sovereignty to a brilliant leader who seemed to offer peace and prosperity. The United Nations and collectivism were movements that perhaps foreshadowed just such an arrangement. Various organizations and institutions were suggested as possible harbingers of the coming Western Confederation that was to fulfill the prophecy of a revived Roman Empire including NATO, the United Nations, and the United States of Europe. Louis S. Bauman, in 1950, regarded NATO as the power that would prevent Russia from invading Europe in her program of expansion, thus forcing her into Palestine. A few years later, Charles E. Pont, in The World's Collision, credited Bauman with predicting, even many years before NATO, the rise of such a power. Quote, we believe the North Atlantic Pact, a potent forerunner of the Ten Kings, if not the real ten. The Ten Kings are, of course, alluding to the, the Ten Horns on the Beast in Daniel and Revelation. A plan for a European defense community was developed in 1952 to meet the Russian threat. But by 1954, it became obvious that because of fear of re rearmed Germany, France would not ratify the plan. After EDC failed, Our Hope magazine observed that it was the passing of another shadow, but that it did demonstrate how a Western Confederation might develop. Later it was said that the EDC had come to life in the new form of NATO, and that it was a shadow of the coming revived Roman Empire. A fear of the United Nations colossus continued to haunt all premillenarians, as they feared the universal government of the coming Antichrist. Even if they cast him in the role of protagonist against the monster Gog, they also cast him as the beast which the Messiah would defeat and cast into hell. Lewis S. Bauman remarked, quote, When the Antichrist shall attain this power over the nations, then the whole world will become indeed united nations, united in one great super government. End of quote. As early as 1950, Bauman had spoken also of a United States of Europe as a possible fulfillment of the revived empire. And in 1956, during negotiations prior to the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which formed the European Economic Community, our hope made the following observation, quote, Thus when we see six nations of Europe, France, West Germany, Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, uniting in common economic and defense schemes, and more than that number, considering seriously the formation of a union of their nations, we think of the Ten Kingdoms power that will come into being and play such an important part in the prophetic scriptures, the revived Roman Empire. End of quote. Every development in Europe or the United Nations that could somehow be credibly interpreted as fulfillment of these fringe area prophecies served to reinforce premillenarian belief in the great drama of Russia's impending invasion of Israel. Some pre-millenarians carried on in the 1950s the attempt to find a specific reference to the United States in the prophesied program of end-time events. The United States is one of Britain's young lions, that's a reference also to Ezekiel 38, continued as a favorite theme. Louis T. Talbot included the United States in prophecies that he ascribed to England. England was to be one of the ten toes in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He said, 
quote, there are, of course, two great toes and eight lesser ones. So also, in that great ten-toed kingdom, there will be ten nations of different powers and strength, and the two great nations will doubtless be England and Italy. The Antichrist will be head over the government in Italy, ruling from Rome. Perhaps Charles E. Pont was a little less, a little self-conscious as he asked his readers in The World's Collision, does this sound like a lot of symbol stretching? We do not think so. Pont believed that World War III was inevitable and was strongly opposed to any nuclear disarmament, fearing it would be to the disadvantage of the United States. That the old stars and stripes would float aloft in the Millennial Kingdom had been Louis S. Bauman's belief in 1942, but in 1950 he was predicting the submergence of the United States into the United Nations under the leadership of the Antichrist. He said, quote, Already Old Glory is battling to maintain its preeminence above the flag. In that day of international control, the old emblem of human freedom will have to fold its wings and perish with liberty. Nothing less than this will satisfy the prophetic picture, end of quote. Much more optimistic was William L. Hull in his book, Israel, Key to Prophecy. He did not believe that Russia and America would fight at all. The United States had shown in the Suez Crisis that Russia could bluff and get what she wanted without fighting. Another totally different view was that of retired Lieutenant General William K. Harrison, Jr., in the Sunday School Times article, Is the United States in Prophecy? His answer was, yes, probably. He found the United States in Revelation 8, 8 and 9. She was to be destroyed in a surprise atomic attack by Russia before Russia went off to fight the beast. It may be assumed that Harrison was advocating preparedness, although the article did not say explicitly. Another participant in the drama of the end was to be China, which took on new significance after the communist takeover in 1949. Leonard Sale Harrison explained in the Sunday School Times that Russia wanted to use the vast hordes of China for her future warfare and wanted Ho Chi Minh's Indochina for her resources. Louis S. Bauman claimed that the recent events in China did not surprise him, for he saw them prophesied in Daniel 11.44, where the Antichrist enemies come out of the east and out of the north. Our Hope magazine observed that the establishment of Russian-Japanese diplomatic relations was in line with biblical prophecy. All Asia would be aligned with the Russians in a great northwestern confederacy. However, Merv Rossell evidently took a different, different route of exegesis as he predicted, quote, I do not believe that China will be the permanent ally of the Soviet, unquote. He foresaw an independent role for the, the kings of the East, those kings that are mentioned in Revelation, when they arrive at Armageddon, where God would smash them all. The unfathomable element in all this premillenarian Armageddon mongering is to what extent it affected their attitudes towards foreign affairs and to what extent it influenced their voting patterns. Admittedly, the evidence for any political behavior has been spotty at best, but any instrument that attempts to plumb the depths of anti-Russian feeling among these people must be calibrated to compensate for their anti-social gospel bias. His, he says the premillenarians saw themselves as wayfaring strangers temporarily passing through this veil of tears on their way to the promised land of heaven. This predisposed them to be non-active politically. Their citizenship was in the kingdom of God. The premillenarian press found political questions taboo, especially those journals that were tied to particular institutions and constituencies. To the extent that they were premillenarians, these people saw Russia in a demonic role as evil to be resisted. To the extent that they were Americans, they saw America as a morally pure crusader whose manifest destiny was to right all wrongs and set the captives free. Since both political parties in America were anti-Russian, 
there was probably little effect on voting patterns, with the possible exception of the 1956 election when Adlai Stevenson openly advocated a unilateral ban on nuclear testing. Even that is merely guessing, for premillenarians avoided public statements on such social political issues. Well, those were the days. Uh, now, of course, Wilson is writing this from the perspective of 1977, and Carter had just come in, and when Reagan comes in three years, four years later, things change, and this, this Cold War is again a subject for front page headlines, even Time Magazine covers, as Ronald Reagan is known for reading and believing the Book of Revelation. So this doesn't go away, and uh, certainly even in the 80s, the, the movement known as the Moral Majority got evangelicals deeply involved in the political struggle, which still goes on. We're heading to, for chapter 10 now, the last chapter before the, the wind-up. Jerusalem, what now? I'll put in a link to uh, Carla Olaf Johnson, ex-Jehovah's Witness, his book, The Gentile Times Reconsidered, where he explodes or detonates the foundation of Watchtower Faith, the Doctrine 1914. I'll also put a link on, to, on your screen to the playlist, Basic Library for Jehovah's Witnesses. See you next time.